Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Ray Sankini, trustee of Westmark School and who also serves on the board of the Park Century School. Ray has a background producing and financing films, including film director James Cameron's Titanic, and she has a daughter at Westmark currently attending 10th grade. She has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Ray, for joining us today. My pleasure. So being the parent of a daughter who has entered Westmark School is such an interesting learning experience for yourself, for the daughter, and indeed for the school. Talk about how your daughter entered Westmark School. Uh, my daughter uh, came from another school uh, that uh, caters to children with language-based learning disabilities. But the kind of education she was getting there was, um, was different in the sense that it was highly individualized to her. She had one-on-one -on -one, uh, math instruction. She had one-on-one -on -one reading instruction, which is wonderful up to a point, and, and she flourished there. But now we're in those last four years where we're trying to prepare her for an independent life, uh, for college, mm -hmm. anything that goes beyond that, comes beyond that. And obviously the world is not going to continue to fit to her. Um, and she has to start that process of, of acclimating to the world and figuring out how to navigate it on her own and uh, learn the vocabulary to advocate for herself and gain the confidence to advocate for herself and, and understand what she has to advocate for, how she explains her uh, learning disabilities to other people so that she can function, so that she can be successful, and so that she can contribute because she is a very bright girl and has many gifts. So we needed a school where they would foster that, where they would support her, they would understand. At Westmark, uh, with the support of you know, highly trained and, and skilled faculty and teachers, she is gaining that. She is working in a regular sized classroom and in some small groups as well. Um, she is learning strategies on how to deal with and compensate for her learning disabilities. I think it's important for people to understand that we're not sending our children to these uh, special schools to fix them. They're not going to get fixed. Their brains are wired differently. We now have the the medical research and the, the understanding to know that, that they just, for whatever reason, their reading centers are in different places in their brain than the normal person, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes that, that comes hand in hand with extraordinary creativity and, and other skills and a different way of thinking and a different uh, perspective on the world that can be incredibly valuable. I mean, there, there is such a long list of overachieving dyslexics. It's unbelievable. Everybody from Winston Churchill to, uh, to Picasso and uh, Steven Spielberg. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, but they do have challenges, and those challenges will remain. What Westmark does is help them learn how to work with them and, and um, advocate for themselves so they get the, um, the accommodations they need to be successful and to be contributing members of society. The thing that I find to be so interesting is that this is just a moment in time where these differences come to the fore because we're so language oriented and so reading oriented. And if you take a look at all of human history, it's really the, the, this moment in time when these issues um, arise in relation to our standard approach to education. And if we shift our approach to education, the issues diminish and shift so that the person's gifts can come to the fore as opposed to being treated as a disability. What I find to be very interesting is that you, you're making a very concrete choice of moving from a completely individualized uh, educational experience for your daughter to a less individualized uh, educational experience at Westmark, mm -hmm. uh, but an educational experience that is geared to children who have dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Talk about the, the full trajectory that you've experienced from K all the way through 10th grade, and, and, and what kind of stages that you've experienced, both in terms of the educational journey, but also the emotional journey of the family. 
Uh, well, I mean, any time a, a child veers off the, uh, the center of the bell curve, especially in those early years, it's incredibly stressful. She's my oldest child. I have two others. But, you know, I was a new mom. And um, I could tell very early on that she was just a little different. I, she was different in her development of language and, and how she used it, um, how comfortable she was with, you know, collaborative play. When she started collaborative play, I was watching it pretty closely. And it's, um, it's painful. I mean, it's really painful because uh, in those early years, if you're, you know, everybody's just bragging in their own way, you know, uh, every, it's, it's, they're quoting percentiles and, uh, you know, how old their child was when they said their first word, when they said their first sentence. Um, and they don't mean to be hurtful, but if you have a child that's not hitting those norms, uh, it, it's the most incredibly painful and, and stressful experience. So that was the first four or five years, and I started seeing specialists very early on, even though it, it hurt, I never went into a denial phase. Um, I see that very often, though, and and actually, at some point, I kind of became the the preschool's go-to person for anybody who the preschool director felt might be dealing with a similar situation and might not be ready to face it and might you need somebody to talk to about it. The first inclination is, is to think, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with my child? What's wrong? Because there's no way to process this information in any other way. That's true. And, and when children are very young, when these issues first start kind of coming to light, it's impossible to know if it's just a normal developmental delay or or what it could be. I mean, I, I saw so many specialists. I went to neurologists, I went to geneticists, I had a developmental pediatrician, um, I started a speech and language therapist, all before my daughter was in kindergarten. And most of them, in fact, all of them said, she's just going to outgrow it. This is just a normal developmental delay. Um, and, you know, we, we think she's yeah, I mean, she's going to close the gap by the time she's six or seven or eight. <laughs> the year kept sliding out, and we sent her to a, a mainstream progressive developmental school, which was incredibly supportive. And I'm, I, I feel so blessed in some way that my, my child with these disabilities was my oldest, because if it weren't for that, I don't think we would have ended up there. And um, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful school called uh, PS Number One in Santa Monica, uh, whose philosophy is, you know, the, the question is not how smart is your child. The question is how is your child smart? So in a way, they sort of had the same philosophy as a Westmark. Mm -hmm. You know, find the child's talents. Don't beat them up right. for, their, for their shortcomings, for their challenges. Um, and that was a great experience for her, unlike so many children with learning disabilities. She emerged from that when we moved her in after fourth grade with her self-esteem intact, knowing she was a little different, knowing she needed a different environment, but not down on herself because of it. It's such a great point, teaching to the talent as opposed to teaching in a way that the child will never be able to grasp because it's it's, it's, it's a disassociated teaching style. It's a pedagogy that just is not correct for that particular child. No, it's just not going to work. And, it's, and you're just, just beating them down to uh, trying to, to, to continue. And it's not, never going to get through because right. their brain is not wired that way. They cannot do that. They cannot learn that way. You know, somebody very wise said to me when I was in the midst of all of this, you know, you'll survive this, she'll survive this, you're doing everything right, you're going to get her to the right place. And remember, kindergarten through 12th grade is the only time in her life when she's going to be expected to be good at everything. <laughs> you know, because we all survive it, right. you know, sort of intact, we hope, or most of us do. And then we go to college and we pursue what really interests us. And usually what interests you is is something you're kind of good at, right. right? We usually don't choose to go into something that we're lousy at. Right. You know, we follow our talents and we usually 
find that you know fulfilling and interesting and rewarding because you know we're successful at it and that's where my daughter is going to end up thanks to to Westmark they're going to get her there they're going to get her to the place where she can pursue you know a general education in college but focus on her strengths her passions her interests you know Picasso wasn't good at everything Einstein wasn't good at everything. Well, maybe Einstein was. I don't know. He was pretty smart. <laughs> no, well, he but was, he was dyslexic. Yeah, well, and he wasn't good at everything. He, uh, and, and each person has their own individual gifts. So after your daughter had, had had this experience, a very good experience, but not necessarily one that was getting her um, to where she felt she needed well, to be. Well, they actually said something interesting to me. When we were wrestling with possibly moving her to uh, a school that specifically... Um, taught to and supported children with language-based learning disabilities, we did uh, neuropsych testing, which is a, it, it takes days, it costs thousands of dollars, and they generate pages and pages and pages, a massive report about how your child learns and how their brains work, and, and um, it, it's, it's really fabulous. And schools like Westmark require that as a, a, a part of the admissions process so that they understand your child and um, and really so that they can figure out whether or not they can help your child because Westmark has no interest in taking a student that they can't help. Right. Um, and so we, we had this big stack of information and we were still uncertain whether to move her or not. So I, I gave the stack to our mainstream school, to the elementary school, and then they read through all of it. Um, and they said, you know, we would be, we think we can support Dominique, that's my daughter's name. Um, we think we, we can make this accommodation, that accommodation, we'll preview material with her, we'll do this, do that, was all spot on, exactly what she needed uh, at that point in time. And I went to the neuropsych and I said, well, they said they'll do this and that, da, 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 da. And she said, that's fantastic, I'm so impressed, but are they going to be just helping, helping her get through this year, or are they going to be helping her understand her disabilities better? Are they going to be helping her understand what strategies she needs to implement right. next year and the year after, because this is not about just getting from one year to the next year. This is really about helping them learn, these children learn, how to navigate the world. Well, it's a series of accommodations from their norm. And so they're creating a very sophisticated approach to deviating from their norm. Whereas at a place like Westmark, that is actually baked into the norm. Mm -hmm. That's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Does your daughter detect that difference in, in, in her experience? Yes. I mean, she has two siblings who are both mainstream. One's uh, in ninth grade at, at Brentwood School. One is still at, at PS1. And she's very aware that the... Um, the uh, approach to teaching is different, certainly very different at Brentwood, which is the most immediate comparison because they're just a year apart grade-wise. And she's very comfortable and, and open about that. And my sons are also uh, very, very clear. We'll tell people my, my sister learns differently, and so she's at the school where they, they teach specifically to her learning style. It's actually been a positive thing in our home because I think my my sons are so accepting and, and tolerant of people's differences. I think, you know, we've, we've really broken down, um, you know, issues of, of color and, and religion. And, you know, certainly in, in um, West Los Angeles, it's a very, very open community, very comfortable with all of these, um, these kinds of, of differences in our society, and yet I think there's still a bit of a stigma when it comes to learning disabilities. And I think that's just a, f a function of ignorance. I also think that it's, it's a real benefit to have um, an understanding of the way people's differences inform their creativity, their thought processes, their conclusions. In any team, if everybody thinks in the same way, uh, it's, it's a sure road to mediocrity and disaster. Um, so the idea of, of having in this uh, familial context this being modeled is, is just, it, it's a wonderful uh, learning opportunity for, for the entire family. 
So as you come into Westmark and your daughter starts to uh, integrate from this uh, very individualized uh, experience Mm -hmm. to more of a group experience, what were the things that that struck you as the major differences in the first year? I think the the thing that struck me the most, and and I believe research is is bearing this out, is how much students gain from other students. Um, you know, I think everybody focuses so much on that teacher student ratio, mm-hmm. and wanting to make sure that there are as as few students per teacher as possible whether at a special needs school or a mainstream school. It's a, it's a ratio we always look at, parents always look at. But there's extraordinary, um, there's an extraordinary amount of learning that takes place among peers. Right. And seeing my daughter in these small groups, I've been amazed. You would think there would be, a, she'd have less of the teacher's time, mm-hmm. and yet whatever reduction in teaching time she's getting is being more than offset by the benefit of being in a group of her peers. I don't know if it's just the motivating effect of wanting to keep up, wanting to do better, um, you know, competing, kind of being in a situation for the first time in some of these subjects where she can really kind of compare herself Mm -hmm. to another person. Um, But it is really just propelling her forward in a really positive way that's been really um, exciting, really, really comforting for me as well because she hadn't been in a, she hadn't done any uh, reading instruction but one-on-one since fourth grade. So um, it was exciting to see her uh, move into that kind of an environment and, and and do well and really succeed and be comfortable participating, which was another big question I had. Would she, she's a little on the shy side, but over time, it didn't start immediately, but she's raising her hand, she's going up to the board and, and working out, figuring out equations and all the kind of stuff that she needs to get more and more comfortable doing over the coming years. And I think she's on a really good path right now. What's great as well is that the way Westmark uh, seems to function is that the students are being equipped with an understanding of learning pedagogies by looking at themselves. And so the students themselves have a certain expertise that other students would not possess. They have a certain attitude that other students would not possess. And in this interaction, it becomes a self-reinforcing, a um, self-propelling experience um, in the classroom that is not only um, enabled by teachers, but by your, your, your fellows. And you become the enabler of their learning as well. It is very powerful. I, I think it's something I had kind of underestimated when we moved into, um, well, Westmark and before that Park Century as well, is that all of these kids have had issues. All of these kids have had challenges. They've had to work harder, you know, and um, uh, there's a lot of character building yes. that goes with that. You know, sometimes I look at my sons and think, you know, you should walk a mile in her moccasins. You know, you're complaining about this and that. You know, you know how hard it is for her. I mean, Terry, you know how hard it is for her to just complete a, a book report, you know, that my, my boys take for granted what they can, you know, just generate and, and do. But she has to really really put her all into it and not give up. Right. I mean, persistence, persistence, resilience. Um, you know, she will work for hours on homework that I know my sons could do in, you know, much less the time. Um, but I think she is very motivated by her, by her school. She loves her school. Um, and they are supportive of her and they are encouraging to her and she wants to do well, and, and um, she is supported by her peers as well. They all have their challenges. They all have to work harder, um, and, and they really, they, they're really there for each other, and they are cheering each other on because um, they, they know they've all lived it. They've all lived it. Not all parents decide to serve on the boards of their schools, and you're serving on the boards of, of two schools. Talk about that role, strategy, its financial strength, its programmatic uh, strength, 
It's diversifying the student body beyond those just with the means to directly fund and providing some funding support. You're also talking about systematizing the knowledge that is produced and exploited by, uh, by Westmark and perhaps helping others to, uh, to benefit from those lessons learned and deploy those lessons learned. Well, that's something I would like to see. Um, assistive technology has uh, played a big role here at Westmark. Westmark is one of the first schools in this area to roll out an iPad program a year and a half ago and is using assistive technology in its classrooms quite a bit now. Um, they had a technology symposium last year and, and schools from all over Los Angeles, Harvard-Westlake, and um, Park Century and many others came to find out about what Westmark is doing with that technology and what um, applications are available to help right. kids like ours. So technology has been a wonderful tool here and in my mind there's no reason why a school like Westmark couldn't participate in designing other applications, other technologies that could help kids who live in rural areas who don't have access to a school like Westmark um, or simply can't afford a school like Westmark and aren't eligible for financial aid. I would love to see Westmark expand its influence uh, beyond these walls um, and really, you know, kind of change the world. Uh, there are people wrestling with these issues all uh, globally, yes. um, in the I don't even know, millions, I would imagine, um, and uh, it's just it's it's so important to to reach them. And I I think that with you know the the resources available to us now in the 21st century, I don't see why Westmark can't do that. And once you have a series of solutions, wouldn't it be a shame to hide that light under a bushel? Absolutely. I could not agree more. There's too much need. There's too much need and there's too much suffering out there. And it's, it's needless. And there's too much talent yes. that we're, we're not tapping into that is out there. Um, and it, being, you know, probably discouraged at some, you know, some school that just doesn't understand. That's all it is. It's just understanding, you know, what, what's going on and what this child needs. Well, Ray Sankini, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank, thank you. you for your insights, and thank you for sharing these, ex these experiences that you've had. My pleasure. Thank Thanks. you so much.